don't want to fight anymore. What are you scared of? You know, I've been told not to talk about it because once they know, when they see this and they know, that's what they'll go after. How did a nice Catholic girl from Pittsburgh just end up here? Don't cry. Don't you dare cry. Shush. Not. I was wondering who was in the. Christy and I. You idiot. Christy and I. Why were you in your car last night crying? I am not gonna sit in a dressing room with a bunch of kids and a bunch of disrespectful mothers. I am a fun person. People don't realize that on the show. But I'm fun. Barrel, barrel laughs here. I don't wanna do it. Imagine this. You're sitting in a chair at a table in a lavish podcast studio lit by soft rose gold coloring with a microphone positioned right in front of you. And to your left is a TV screen with the name and logo of your podcast. In front of you, another microphone, a glass of water, and a middle-aged woman with large voluminous hair, many bracelets, bright red lipstick, and huge metal stars hanging from her ears. The two of you are having a cordial but deep conversation about her career, encompassing the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. She speaks to you about the proudest moments in her life and the children she helped turn into international superstars. She tears up as she talks about the relationship she no longer has with many of them. And when she discusses her recent health scares, the conversation turns bittersweet. This is a capital I interview, at times funny, at other times frustrating, but all in all, pretty interesting. And then the conversation takes a turn for the bizarre when the two of you start talking about, of all things, a white chocolate coconut bunt cake from a place known as Doan's Bakery. As the two of you wax on and off about this delicious sounding cake, your subject switches focus and asks if you've ever seen the 1983 movie All the Right Moves, starring Tom Cruise as, quote, a high school football player. And then without prompting, your subject goes on to say, quote, oh, that's my downfall. I like the high school school football players. I still like them. You Have you seen what? All the Right Moves? No. That's the best movie ever. With him in it? Oh my god, yes, All the Right Moves. He's a high school football player. Oh my Ooh. God. That's my downfall. I like the high school football players. I still like them. <sighs> okay, so that's an objectively weird thing to say, but you brush it off and talk about how it's coaches that can be sort of hot, right? So then she responds, not one that used to be in high school, but one that is. I like the coaches. Not one that and used I to did. be in high school, but one that is, yes. <sighs> Well, um, yeah, so I, I guess at this point you have no choice but to end the interview because uh, <laughs> what the hell, right? Well, you've been speaking to 58-year-old Abby Lee Miller, the notorious head of the Abby Lee Dance Company and figurehead at the front of the show Dance Moms, a show that followed the sheer amount of blood, sweat, and tears that went on to shaping the futures of a dozen or so child dancers, many of whom have gone on to very successful careers in Hollywood and online, such as Maddie Ziegler, Kalani Hilliker and none other than Jojo Siwa. No one has made this dramatic of a change yet. No one has made in my generation this extreme of a switch and I am the first in the generation. It is very scary but someone's gotta do it. Now from a distance this statement would seem like an odd and disturbing thing for a woman known for working with children to say and I wouldn't blame you for thinking that because yeah especially when she doubled down on Instagram the following Monday. I do like those hot, athletic, muscular types of guys. The jocks. I always have and I always will. Because you know, as I always say, say something questionable about children and then double down on it. And yet to everybody familiar with Abby Lee Miller and the way she talks to children about children and how she genuinely conducts herself in her day-to-day -day life, this comment wasn't actually all that shocking because after nearly a decade at the head of the Dance Moms Empire, Abby Lee Miller has become infamous for everything from physical altercations with parents to alleged emotional abuse of countless children to allegations of racism, of course, to actual criminal convictions for years of financial fraud relating to her time at her own dance company. Has been given opportunity after opportunity and after I opportunity. And I, I have sent her to New York for auditions. And she's won every time. time. I do all of these things, Melissa. You know, we all make mistakes, Abby. I've yeah, but you did, you hurt your own kid. You didn't hurt me. I 
I realize that, Abby. No solo this weekend. But what about some perspective? What could possibly be an explanation if one even exists? Well, as you'll find out the further this story goes, the problem with Dance Moms may seem to start with Abby Lee Miller, but they really go even much deeper than that, and also much, much darker. And this is what we know. Hi everyone, uh, this is Future Me. Uh, I just wanted to pop in here really quick and give a huge thank you to all of you. Uh, if you wanna skip this, there should be some time code, but I just wanted to give a huge thank you. Uh, as some of you know, I was recently violently physically assaulted and it has been a lot. It's, 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 it's been a lot to, to process and to deal with. Um, I was injured and I just needed to take some time uh, to, to mend a little bit and to heal um, and to just kind of, you know, not be on camera for a little bit. There was a, a community tab post that was made uh, just giving a little bit of the details of what was going on. And um, my mom encouraged me to go and read your comments. And I'm just, again, so blown away by your, your kindness and your generosity. And there were so many of you who have been reaching out just to send me nice thoughts and warm wishes or a little, you know, kitty or puppy photos uh, to help me feel better. And, and what really encouraged me was just seeing so many of you feel uh, like you could share even bits of your own story. And that was just, I've read so, so, so many of your stories and I think you are just so brave and so strong and powerful. Even if you don't feel like you are, uh, I just wanna remind you that you're not alone. And I also know, you know, I've been working with my mental health support team to just, keep going and moving forward through this. You know, I did not have a support system in my personal life for a very long time. And now that I do, I'm so thankful. And I, I realize that there are still so many people, probably many of you out there who feel like you don't have any type of support in your personal life. I just think that that really underscores the importance of, of community. And so thank you to, to all of you who have been just uplifting. I've seen many of you comment on each other's stories and just uplifting people who may not feel like they have support. And I just, I think that is so beautiful. We have such an incredible community and I'm so honored to be a part of this. Living through abusive situations is not easy. It is very complicated. Uh, and healing is not linear. I've definitely learned that, but you're not alone. And I just appreciate all of you so, so, so much. Uh, I have been slowly uh, integrating myself back into the work. Uh, that is where I feel happy. And I'm very much looking forward to being fully back very, 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 very soon. Anyways, I'm being long-winded, but I just want to say thank you. Yeah, all right. I will let you go to the rest of this video that you actually clicked in to watch, and I will see you very, very soon. Thanks. Oh, hi there. Hello, hello, hi. It's my face again. Swoo! If you're seeing me for the first time, welcome. I'm a filmmaker, documentarian, and commentary creator, and I make swoop docs and short films on unsolved cases, true crime, and social media influencers who abuse their power and manipulate audiences because, as I always say, it's not drama, it's dangerous. So you'll get the facts, my perspective, and some commentary, and a chance to share your own, okay? We also dig deeper into fascinating angles, play devil's advocate, and sometimes we take it to Petty University because, honey, listen, okay, Petty is my co mechanism for all the challenges in life. So if you want to join the Petty University community, all are welcome. Go ahead, feel free to introduce yourself amongst the class. We're a fun bunch. Also, you can connect with me on Instagram and Twitter. That's where I post most often. And of course, for those of you who want, you can still grab your very own apparel pieces from the Valid Rib Cage and Valid Social Club collections in the Petty University shop linked below as always. Listen, in a world full of so much bad, I believe that we should be able to wear things that make us feel good and hopefully others feel feel good who might be seeing the messaging. Okay, we're gonna dive into this story, but real quick, a big thank you to today's sponsor, Murder in the Alps, and to all of you for watching. Now, I don't know about you, but I am obsessed with crime and mystery games and solving the whodunit. They just kind of help me relax. And recently, I've been loving Murder in the Alps, a free, fully interactive adventure game, and I think that you will love it too. So picture this, Murder in the Alps is a crime novel where action takes place in the 1930s, set in a hotel tucked away 
in one of the most beautiful locations in the Alps with a deadly secret. Now, one of the guests goes missing and then other strange things start happening. So a journalist named Anna must solve the mystery and figure out which one of the 10 other characters could be the killer. Y'all, I am obsessed with this game. It is fully interactive. It's filled with dark secrets and you can interact with all of the characters which shape how the story unfolds, which is just so satisfying. Now, my favorite character is Anna because, you know, we love a good journalist. So you get to solve these mind boggling puzzles, travel to many unique locations from the gorgeous Alps to the blood filled cellars. It basically has it all. And let's be real, like we could all use some time off from social media with something just fun and relaxing. And listen, it's not just another hidden object game, okay? I absolutely love that it has these thrilling comics, 12 chapters with tons of mini games, puzzles, close ups, and most importantly, 12 different meta investigations. And with plot twists around every corner, this game is like an emotional roller coaster, okay? It is filled with passion, it's got the surprise, and of course, it's got the meta. I'm just so hooked, okay? <laughs> And just a sidebar, it gives like a movie-like experience with professional voiceovers and sound effects. So you're definitely gonna wanna play with the sound on whenever possible. And the best part of all, the game is free and available for iOS and Android. Yes, F-R-E-E, -E, free. So can you find the answer to the murder in the Alps? <laughs> Click the link in my description box or use the QR code here to download the game straight to your phone right now. I absolutely love this game, I think you will too. So download and start playing today because you deserve it, honey. Okay, friends, let's dive into the dark world of Dance Moms and Abby Lee Miller. Before we get into just how off the rails the Dance Mom story gets, we have to start with how surprisingly on the rails the Abby Lee Miller story was for a very long time. So Abigail Lee Miller was born on September 21st, 1965 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the only child of a man named George L. Miller and a woman named Marion Lorraine Miller, who herself was a dance teacher and studio owner. So when Abby was growing up, she took part in doing a number of extracurricular activities. Uh, for example, she was in the Girl Scouts, she was in Ski Club, and she even took up playing the clarinet, believe it or not. Abby referred to herself as a bit of a daddy's girl since her dad would take her, you know, to all of those things. But by all of these accounts, her parents were very supportive of her, even if her dad was a little brash at times. Christina Ruvalis wrote uh, a feature on Abby in Pittsburgh Magazine back in 2013. And according to Christina, Abby's dad dad once told her, quote, you are dumb enough for twins. I, I have no freaking idea what that means exactly. It's like, to me, I hear like dumb enough for twins and I think like uh, two braids are better than what? I, maybe, I, I don't know what I'm missing y'all, but regardless of whatever that phrase means, that kind of insult uh, is what fueled Abby to work harder at anything that she loved doing. And it also set the stage for a few of her own character traits as an adult. Eventually, Abby started taking classes at her mother's dance studio. Now, what you might find interesting about this is that Abby herself did not actually like dancing. Yeah, uh, or more specifically, she didn't like performing live. Now, according to Abby herself, even when she was as young as 13, she was much more interested in figuring out choreography, especially which steps were effective, uh, which songs were the best fit for which costumes and so on. So it was at the age of 13 that Abby started traveling with her mom across the country to a number of national uh, dance conventions. So it was the 1970s and dance was in the air, baby, disco, dance and marathons, the YMCA, the hustle, all of it was happening. Dancing was big for everyone, everywhere, all across all ages, races, and creeds. So most kids interested in dance would be exposed to something like this and maybe want to participate. Abby, a true entrepreneur, even as a child, wanted something more. Uh, she didn't want to just be one dancer. She wanted to train all of the dancers. Yes, now let me dabble in all of it. Uh, she actually elaborated on this further on Bethany Frankel's podcast, uh, Just Be. At 13 years old, got a flyer in the mail at my house. My mom did. Where, where and it were was you living? In Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay. Where I was born and raised. Born and raised in Pittsburgh in the suburbs. 
about 20 minutes out of the city. Okay, so I, my dad worked at uh, the railroad in conjunction with the steel mills. So, I mean, he had an office job, you know, eventually, but it was a good job, really good job. And my mother had seven studios in Miami, Florida. And she didn't want, she, the reason she left and moved to Pittsburgh to marry my dad is she didn't want to walk out on her pension, him to walk out on his pension and his benefits and all that. Because her dad did that for Westinghouse and walked out and they had nothing. So she moved back to Pittsburgh, hated it every minute of her life. Uh, the, not the marriage, the, the, the city. And like, okay, this next part sounds untrue, but I swear it's in every single Abby Lee biography that I've read. So when Abby was 14 years old, she asked her mom if she could recruit a few of her students to start her own dance company and her mom straight up agreed. That's right, at the age of 14, Abby Lee Miller founded the Abby Lee Dance Company or ALDC for short. Uh, the company at the center of the dance mom's dynasty. She started it at 14. That's like her lover or leave her. That's pretty incredible at 14, right? And then she, I mean, her kids were dancing at the Fontainebleau with the Rat Pack and Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. When the band took a break, my mother's girls performed. Got it. So I was in Pittsburgh. I was doing my once a week dancing school. I was a Girl Scout. I was uh, I took ice skating and roller skating and I played the clarinet. I was on the swim team. I did everything right. and nothing, nothing well. I mean, this is like one of those moments where people like, you know, they turn it into a meme and then it just makes you feel lazy as hell. Like, did you know that they were only this old when so-and-so did this? You know, like Orson Welles directed Citizen Kane, I think when he was like 25. Prince, my my beloved Prince, dropped in 1999 when he was only 23. I think his first album he'd like recorded all the instruments for when he was like 17, 18, 19, something nuts. Even Gidget the Taco Bell Chihuahua said Yo Quiero Taco Bell when she was only three which is, I don't know, is that like 28 in human years? I don't know. And here we are with Abby Lee Miller flexing on everyone by opening a whole ass dance company when she was only 14. So I feel like a massive underachiever, but okay, I will deal with that later. Now, obviously it wasn't some kind of overnight success thing where she was, you know, screaming at children and molding young minds for better and worse uh, when she herself was a young mind, but Abby figured out what she wanted to do at an early age and she did it, which honestly, I can applaud 14 year old Abby for that. Like it's pretty rare to be that driven at that age. Now, when she was just 22, she got a $540,000 loan and opened a dance studio on Salzburg Road in Pittsburgh. Uh, the same location that was open until around December 2022. We'll find out what happened to that a little bit later because it ain't good. And one of Abby's biggest innovations to her studio was an observation deck for her students' uh, moms so that they could watch the classes themselves. And also according to Abby's Pittsburgh Magazine profile, so that the moms would stop, quote, whining when the children didn't get a solo, which kind of really smart, right? If you think about it, that's, that's, that's really smart then the parents get to watch their kids and, and if their kids you know like aren't like really that great then the parents could see it happening or and not maybe blame the choreographer maybe anyways i don't know so over the years, Abby made a bit of a name for herself regionally and even nationally as a dance instructor and saw varying degrees of success in the field. By the end of the 2000s, Abby was spending a few weeks in Los Angeles. So sometimes Abby says it was Vegas. So like, I don't know, like, let's just say like a vague Angeles, Las, Las Vegas, La, La, Los, Los Vegas, not La, get it, Los, whatever, I'm trying people. But with a friend by the name of John Corella, a former competitive dancer who had found founded uh, the Corella Dance Company. The two of them would share stories about what it was like working at dance studios. The conversation naturally pivoted over to a show that was big on Fox uh, at the time, So You Think You Can Dance, which if you if you didn't know, if you haven't watched it, that, that show features performers showing off their dance moves or, or lack thereof, because they like to do those types of moments. Abby remembers thinking about the show that the producers of this show were missing potential gold because, quote, they are missing the dance studio experience, the dance teachers, the mom and dance teacher relationship. And honestly, I wish we were still missing that because that would mean some of this 
It didn't exist because it didn't happen, but that's not where this story goes. Uh, what Abby didn't know is that after this conversation, John couldn't stop thinking about their talk and actually made a formal pitch for a show about an inside look at the wide world of dance studios to Brian Stinson, a producer who liked the pitch enough to present it to a man named Jeff Collins, who pitched it to a lifetime. See, that's sometimes they go that easy, a pitch and then a pitch, and then there you are, you're a bitch. But in reality, yeah, it's kind of like playing telephone for pitches and, and some time for bitches. I'm sorry, I Petty is trying to, it's, I will, I will reel it back in, okay, I'm sorry. But you know what these pitches, Lifetime were thankfully uh, the end of the line for the show that they described as a cross between real housewives and toddlers and tiaras and they greenlit the concept for John and Brian and not Abby, but more on that in a second. Now, originally the show was allegedly set to be more of a documentary style look at five different mothers of child dancers across five cities to show the differences a city can make on the socioeconomic status of a child in dance. And I'm already bored saying that out loud because no one wants to watch that, you know, whatever. But John and Brian didn't like any of the moms in those other cities. Uh, they only liked the moms in Pittsburgh. As Abby Lee would later claim it was because, quote, they decided there was a whole lot of crazy in Pittsburgh. Clearly her words, not mine. Okay, hi Pittsburgh, love you, Mwah. Now, according to Christy Lukasiak, uh, one of the moms picked in the casting call, it was the fact that the women weren't just talking about dancing or their daughters or how proud they were. Literally every mom picked referenced one another. And as Christy put it, this, this casting director realized that all of the moms that he liked were all from the same studio. And all of our tapes, we weren't just talking about dance and our daughters, we were all talking on each other. And he was like, hold on a minute here. He's like, there's a little bit, like you had the toddlers and tiaras element to it because the kids were dancing and talented and the glitter and the makeup and the hair and all of that. But then you had these moms that had this really long history with each other, which was kind of unusual because most reality shows, they cast people and yeah, like maybe the housewives know each other from a party and stuff, but we were women who had been sitting next to each other for years. And we had like all of this history and this dirt on each other that we were like still willing to bring up at a moment's notice, which is half the reason why we fought so much because it wasn't that we were fighting about what you thought we were fighting about is we were still mad about something that had happened five years ago. He got these casting tapes and he quickly realized that he liked moms from the studio. And they were like, oh, maybe there's something with a team. Now, from the start, John and Brian had Abby involved in a number of ways, uh, with a casting call being posted at her studio and on her website. Now, the first mom hired for the show was a woman named Kathy Nesbitt Stein, uh, who the production thought was a quirky. Uh, her daughter was Vivi Ann Stein, a six-year-old musical theater and tap dancer. Wow, that's a lot of things to be achieving at six years old. Bravo, way to go, that's awesome. And Kathy convinced Kelly Highland to come on next, a former dancer herself who had even been taught by Abby when she was younger. Uh, her daughters were Brooke Highland, a 13 year old acro contemporary dancer and singer, and Paige Highland, a 10 year old acro jazz dancer and model. Now, and none of these girls were actually students of Abby's originally, uh, but were cast on the show just for being the, the fit that the producers wanted. But next up was Melissa Ziegler Gassani, who was the mother of two girls who actually had trained under Abby, so six-year-old Mackenzie Ziegler, as well as a name you might already recognize, eight-year-old Maddie Ziegler, a lyrical, contemporary, and tap dancer. And if you didn't already know, yes, this is the same Maddie Ziegler from the Sia videos and like a bazillion other dance videos. We will we will come back to some of that a little bit later. Now, from there, the producers brought on Holly Hatcher Frazier, the mother of nine-year-old contemporary dancer Nia Frazier, aka Nia Sue, Christy Lukasiak, the mother of nine-year-old Chloe Lukasiak, a lyrical slash contemporary and ballet dancer from Mars, Pennsylvania, and Gianni Martello, an instructor covering all genres of dance. But oh, what good is a show about a dance studio drama without a dance studio? So enter back to the scene, the Abby Lee Miller Dance Studio and Abby Lee herself, who was hired as the show's choreographer. But it's worth noting that the cast of the 
show changed relatively often for a number of reasons that I will cover later. Not all of them, but you know, several of them. But that also means that some of the most famous names in Dance Moms history weren't in this original batch. So you got names like Kira Gerard, who was the mother of contemporary and lyrical dancer Kalani Hilliker, or Jessalyn Siwa, the mother dearest of Jojo Siwa. Now, as someone who wasn't too familiar with Dance Moms before I started looking into the behind the scenes drama, if you will, of the show, I was a little surprised to find out that uh, Kalani and Jojo come on much later than the original girls. Uh, we'll talk more about them later, but for now, just know that they're like not a part of the initial experience. So if the premise didn't end up being what was initially pitched, what did it end up becoming? Well... Don't cry! Don't you dare cry! Shush! Not! I was Shut wondering who's in the- Christy and I! You idiot! Christy and I! Believe it or not, that's not actually what most of Dance Moms is. And your honor, let the record reflect. These compilation clips titled Abby's Wildest Freakouts She Lashes Out are all published to the actual Dance Moms channel. Like they're just like, they are, mm, they are loud and proud of this woman lashing out at at and around kids. So, you know, do with that what you will. I know what I'm gonna do with that later. I'll just go throw it in the trash. But you know, some people find this entertaining. <laughs> and even though she was a lot better than Kendo and a lot stronger, she didn't blow me away either. She was a kid that had the potential to make it, to have a career in this business, not have her own integrity, her own ambition. She wanted to come out of the car and walk in. She wanted to come then why didn't you, what, what kind of parent were you to not let her? But yeah, that's not what most of Dance Moms actually is. Uh, the show follows the ALDC's Junior Elite Competition team, which is a team of dancers that are all between the ages of six and 13, traveling every week to a different dance comp to win awards and prepare for nationals. All the while, Abby claims that she's training the girls to be, quote, a professional, employable, a working a dancers. Uh, now, Abby would conceptualize the dancers alongside her instructors and the show's producers, and she was usually the one who did the choreography. Now the show followed the moms around, and just so some people know, cause like, I, I think this is like a question that pops up. I'm a, I'm a dancer, I'm a, a musician, recording artist and performer. I've done a lot of touring, all that kind of stuff. And I have worked with uh, several choreographers, but I have one that I work almost exclusively with often. And uh, there are a lot of choreographers in this industry that the, they, they choreograph by title, that they're basically putting, the, putting it all together, but they're not necessarily creating all of the moves, nor are they necessarily teaching the dancers. They oftentimes will have an assistant who actually does all of that work, if that makes sense. I know there are a lot of times where people will be like, how is she like the choreographer and like doing all of these intricate dance stuff? And the answer is she's not most likely. Um, she would oftentimes choreographers have assistants who do the heavy lifting in that regard. So anyways. So the show followed the moms around and in typical reality TV format, painted them as each other's rivals who argued and talked a lot of to each other and Abby creating a lot of that sensational drama, reality drama, you know, entertainment, <laughs> reality TV, blah, 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 blah. I don't want anyone to think I'm not grateful for that opportunity and experience. I am incredibly grateful for it. However, it was a really hard time for me on the show. Definitely the hardest thing I've ever been through. So I don't really talk about it a lot. Might also be a fun fact to mention, but according to uh, former Dance Mom star Chloe, the production was tight knit and even more tightly budgeted with all of the girls being uh, taught by one tutor under one roof in a doctor's office down the road from the ALDC. Fact number seven. So our base camp was actually a doctor's office. Little known fact. There was my old studio and then there was like a road and then there is a doctor's office and that served as our base camp. So that's where the tutoring room was. That's where a lot of the crew's offices were. That's where the interview rooms were. That's where we had lunch all the time. It served as like like, like I said, our base camp. Most of the action on camera was at the studio, but everything else was in a, a, a doctor's office. Uh, and if you've ever seen a TV film crew, even like a small one like this sounds like it may have been, that is a lot of freaking people to shove in one office. 
Now, we don't know what the exact schedule early on for Dance Moms was like for the girls, but in a now privated video from Jojo Siwa, which I always love introducing things like that, in a now privated video from Jojo Siwa, we can uh, see wa. <laughs> it was right there, I had to. Uh, we can see wa what the schedule was like for the girls a little later down the road. In the video, she says that uh, to start, a bunch of the girls would carpool with one of the moms to get uh, their school in in the morning, quote, we do school from eight o'clock to 11 o'clock. So then we eat lunch until about noon. Then at noon, we go to set. That's right across the street from the school that we go to. And the set is obviously Abby's studio. We go from about one to four or five, and then we continue to dance all night. Then Wednesdays, I would go to school and then I'd go to the studio. We'd film, we'd learn most of our group number. We'd film some more. And then on Thursdays, whoever had a solo duet or trio that week would normally get out of school early and go to the studio and learn the number. And then we would begin filming. So then we would finish up the group number on camera and then we would start the solos, duets, and trios on camera. Then we would rehearse and we'd clean the group number and hopefully finish the solos, duets, and trios that same day. Never went to school on Fridays. We went to school four days a week. So this was a daily schedule that came out to be something like 12 hours a day, every day for presumably all of the dancers. So what about Abby? Where does she fit in? She wasn't just the choreographer, right? Well, it wasn't until after filming started that the producers of the show realized that Abby Lee Miller is intense. Wait, do something. Done. Like really intense. You know, I have so many feelings about this woman, but I am just trying to, we're just, I'm just gonna document we're just documenting the facts. From this point on, Abby became a central focus on the show because as Christy puts it, Abby was amazing television. Uh, it was that realization that truly shifted what Dance Moms was going to truly be about, a dance teacher and her team, and then also the moms. Now, in case you couldn't tell from those intense clips earlier, and I really hope that I can play these clips. Yes, it is fair use, but I tried to play some things in the JoJo Siwa uh, doc that I did previously and let's just say there was a little yeah, there were a few moments and I had to cut some things. So hopefully I don't have to do that here. A huge part of what made Dance Moms Dance Moms was Abby's performance as a very strict coach who, as time went on, began leaning more and more on criticism to motivate the girls, sometimes leaning into more personal digs against the kids. Yeah, great. And to be clear, this allegedly is the mild version of what Abby Lee was like with these girls. According to Jill Vertis, a mom uh, from later seasons of Dance Moms, uh, people think that Abby's behavior gotta be for the cameras and it's not. It's really who she is. Abby, would you like the end piece with all the icing? No, no, no. Or do you want, or do you want us to stab the fork in your eyes? You decide. Now, later in the interview, she pointed to the girls and elaborated further by saying, quote, you can all attest that she would be worse when the cameras were off because she really doesn't want everybody to hate her. So to be clear, according to this mom, this is what Abby was like when she didn't want people to hate her. Let that sink in. And by let that sink in, I also mean, you know, when we're looking at like the perspectives of things where we think about what could Abby's perspective possibly be with this, right? And well, she's probably being being told by the producers, this is great television, it's going to be great for the ratings, or it currently is great for the ratings, and do it, it's making the show a success. So we weigh that in, Abby's saying, okay, great, this is working, this is hit television. But then the other perspective is the kids, right? There's the mom's perspective and then there's the kids. I wondered, are the moms who, you know, who have their children in these environments, I'm guessing that they're kind of feeling the pressure and like my child could be a star. This is what we have to go through. There's money here. We are getting eyeballs. Uh, I want her to have a career. My kid wants this career, maybe. I don't always know that the kids always want this. Sometimes it seems like the parents want it more. Uh, and then I think about the child's perspective of like, they're literally kids. Their brain hasn't like fully developed. I don't think that they they can separate entirely what is reality and what is reality TV. You know what I mean? 
adults have a better time with that, and I think even adults struggle with that on reality television. But like to expect a kid to like just see this type of behavior and the yelling and stuff, and expect them to be able to know, hey, this isn't real, but it is real. But it isn't real, but it is real. Like I just, how could that not psychologically mess with them? Okay, back to it. So some of Abby's teaching uh, bordered on one might call psychological warfare with the introduction of the Pyramid, which was a board with all of the young girls' headshots on it. In the first season, Pyramid, or chalkboard rather, because that's what it started out as, was only about 20, 30 minutes max. And no, we never did Pyramid before the show. Was Pyramid a thing? No, it wasn't. It's not a normal thing to do. Let's rank children and tell them how terrible they are, and then the one child at the top we're gonna, you know, give them compliments, Ugh, it's so healthy. Now, originally the pyramid was made by production for a shot in the show to easily introduce each girl for the audience, but it quickly evolved into a way for Abby to rank each girl based on a certain set of criteria. You know, like how the girls did last week, what their attitude was like, <laughs> that's amazing Abby judging the kids' attitude, how much effort Abby believed they put in, uh, what the girls' overall behavior was like, and also what their mom's behavior was like. Next we have Jojo, you were fifth in the competition. You're fifth on the pyramid. Sometimes you act like a five-year-old. She did a solo, you poured blood on her, you put a four-inch crown on her head. She did a good job. She did a good job. She's telling, telling you. Now, when asked how she can live with herself for criticizing prepubescent girls back in 2013, Abby told Christina at Pittsburgh Magazine she is not a villain and that her girls respect her for telling the truth. <laughs> we'll find out how much respect they have later. Quote, kids get a trophy just for being born, end quote. Now, I just want you to remember that, okay? Please remember that. Uh, and, and listen, like I have set, I've tried as much as possible to set my petty hat down for a minute and I'm trying my best to be impartial with Abby Miller, y'all, but she, it just, she, <laughs> She makes it very damn hard, okay? Th this is me being fair to Abby and quoting an article that paints her being this way to kids as an achievement. Like, no shade to Pittsburgh Magazine, the reporting is clearly outstanding, but the whole, like, kind of like, hell yeah, Abby Lee is fighting against participating trophy snowflake-ass culture when it's talking about how she treats kids is a choice. It is, a, it's a choice. It's a choice. We all have choices and that's the choice that they choiced. Also a choice, how Abby conducts herself regarding that damn pyramid. Top of the pyramid, we have Kendall. Division, obviously. See, there's a weird dynamic at play on Dance Moms between Abby Lee Miller and Maddie Ziegler. Now, Maddie is the star of the show. Remember the time she's very young. According to Abby, she's the star and she was her prize student, her crowning achievement. She even said once that, quote, uh, people ask me why the show works. The moms are jealous of Maddie. Now, to be clear, some of this is even fed into by Maddie's mom, Melissa, who downplayed that by telling an interviewer that all the dancers were wonderful, but was also at the same time close friends with Abby. Again, if you think reality television is reality, oh, it's not, it is not, it is not. It is plotted, planned, twisted, and distributed to the masses, presented as if it's just real, no. Seriously, like watching Abby Lee Miller bark orders and criticisms at little girls was maybe shockingly not repellent to most people and ensured that Dance Moms would go on to be a massive hit. And, and that's the thing, like let's have an, another quick devil's advocate perspective moment uh, because I imagine many of you are horrified by how Abby has behaved around these youngsters. The thing is people tuned in a lot, like a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, to put into perspective what a hit show was by season three, Dance Moms was averaging just over 2 million views per episode with nearly 3 million people tuning in for the premiere alone. Spinoff shows were made like Abby's Ultimate Dance Competition where Abby uh, gave us her best Simon Cowell impersonation alongside three other judges uh, who rated young dancers from around the country. Dance Moms Miami was a thing which was literally Dance Moms 
films, you know, in Miami. Abby's Studio Rescue, where Abby traveled the country helping struggling studios get fixed and so on and so on and so on. The public tuned in by the masses. So, so my perspective question for y'all right now, let me know your thoughts in the comments is, what does that say about all of this? Like, is the public consumption of this a problem? Is it totally fine? Like, I know I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit, but I, I think about that as we go along here because there are so many moving parts. I know a lot of times, you know, when, when there starts to be criticisms of shows like this, people will blame, you know, the central face, which is Abby Lee Miller. But there are a lot of faces involved, uh, the, uh, all of the adults who are running the, the crew and the, the director and the studios, the producers, the executive producers who are financing this, the, the platform it's distributed on and and the consumers who are watching it and tuning in, which is the reason why they keep making more episodes. Where do we sit? I don't want to condemn people for watching the things that they watch, but also it raises a lot of questions, right? There's a really interesting bit of foreshadowing in that Pittsburgh Magazine article uh, that I mentioned earlier that says, and I quote, neither Miller nor Lifetime will disclose how much Abby makes or discuss financial arrangements behind her business ventures. Now, I just want you to store that in the back of your mind for a while because it doesn't exactly end well. Anyway, so just like that, you have the formula for Dance Moms, one of the unlikeliest hits in reality TV history. And even though I found it quite difficult not to rip Abby uh, like a little bit. That was me being fair because behind the scenes on Dance Moms, it turns out that the show was plagued with everything from controversies to real life feuds that ended sometimes in violence to even much, much darker realities hidden from the screen. Yes, there was uh, an altercation at one of the competitions. The mothers just kept riding me, riding me, riding me about class. It was a complete joke to me. Early on, what happened behind the scenes on Dance Moms was pretty benign compared to some of the other big reality shows of the time, like The Biggest Loser. The, the controversies here were more fundamental, like, you know, in what world is talking to children like this acceptable in any way? Uh, now, considering that the answer to how Abby can get away with acting like this is literally in the title, think about that, this criticism never really blossomed into a full controversy. Uh, so in early seasons, controversies were things like Abby being accused by by the moms of privately prepping Maddie, her favorite, to perform a dance solo without music, all while giving the competition a scratched CD so Maddie would become victorious no matter what, which is freaking wild. I'm sorry, that's just, that is, that's unhinged. Other controversies were more of the manufactured reality TV drama kind, like when uh, Jill freaked out after fighting with Abby over her daughter Kendall's dance costume. Like, whatever, whatever, Jill, whatever. I'll take my bag and go home right now. Is that, would that make you guys all really happy? Jill's throwing shoes and she's cursing and all I'm thinking is you are so hard to take seriously wearing that hat. So maybe one of the most notorious controversies from the show happened in the earliest seasons, uh, one that was as controversial then as it is now. I'm talking about the time that Dance Moms, a show starring prepubescent girls, released an episode titled, and I wish I was, but I am not making this up, Topless Showgirls. Our costumes were just stunning on the girls. So I think that my moms are gonna keep their mouths shut about costumes from now on. I'm listening to the audience hoot and holler at my 10 year old and I've never been so mortified. Yeah, this whole thing, it, it is just, it is, it's so awful, man. Like I'm, I'm just gonna like blur the whole clip. Like, and, and they don't, they don't blur and it's, it's up and it's not, but I'll explain it. Like each of the girls is learning a burlesque style dance while wearing, f you know, flesh tone bras and tights to give off the impression that they were not clothed doing striptease style dance moves, you know, like with the feathers and stuff. And they'd be like, boo -doo, boo -boo -boo -boo. and it's like, ah, you know, like, eh, like what you would see in like those old retro Vegas, like showgirl things where they're, hi, my girls are here. That kind of stuff. Like this is what you would expect to only see grown ass people doing. This episode was instantly controversial and has actually been removed from uh, all future releases of the show on streaming and in physical media. So a uh, good, uh, you know who doesn't seem to regret the choice? 
fucking Abby Lee Miller, feed lady, who at the time defended the choice by saying, quote, everyone in the industry knows the girls are completely covered and everything is harmless. She was were just stunning on the girls. So I think that my moms are gonna keep their mouths shut about costumes from now on. Abby, honey, Abby, please, my God. Ah, can you sit down? Just sit, just sit down. I just like, I look at this and I'm like, you were making small girls do a burlesque show and pretending to be nude. But oh, you know, ha, it's okay because they're not actually nude. I just, in my personal opinion, that's literally essualizing your cast of kids and showcases an incredible lack of self-awareness that I rarely ever see played this straight. But again, allegedly, what do I know? I'm listening to the audience hoot and holler at my 10 year old and I've never been so mortified. But this was par for the course for Abby Lee Miller who said and did uh, whatever the f she wanted whenever the f wanted, like when she allegedly forced Maddie to kiss a boy for a dance, a kiss that turned out to be Maddie's first kiss, but not before Abby literally planted one herself on a clearly uncomfortable Maddie. I did not sign up to kiss Gino and it's a little awkward for me because he likes me. Like, I'm not Like I can't even like I like I I'm just gonna blur that because I just I don't even I don't even understand it and I just I think about like if Abby Lee Miller were a man and did that to this young Maddie how would that go down I don't think it would go down very well I'm not really sure why this went down okay I it's a lot the more like I looked into this, I just kind of feel like the whole thing is a dumpster fire, but it was a dumpster fire that, you know, to Abby Lee Miller looked a lot more like a gold mine, you know, exploit the kids, use the moms as shields, lather, rinse, repeat, allegedly. But like nothing was going to separate Abby from this kind of entertainment gold, you know, until something did. Okay, let's shift focus to Kelly Highland for a second, the mom of Brooke and Paige. Now, Kelly has quite a history with Abby Lee Miller because as I mentioned, Kelly actually trained under Abby as a teenager. And I wonder what that experience was like, but because Kelly had been on the receiving end of Abby's unique teaching style, she also managed to develop a bit of a combative fight or flight response to Abby on the show and in real life. And I really wonder, was she mistreated by Abby and is that kind of a bit reactive to the things that she had experienced as a teen. I don't know. These are, this is just speculative thoughts that I have in my head. But these two fought a lot. Don't slam my door. I'll slam whatever I want. Look at your daughter. She's 14 years old. She couldn't do the turns and suck in her knees, but okay, she's so we're kind of with her. Come on, you only give them practice with their turns. Give the other she's teacher in the same group. studio with the same teachers. I need to go somewhere else. Yes. Me and Christy. And in typical Abby fashion, she took out this frustration on Kelly's daughter, Paige, a lot. Dad. <gasps> you, Abby. Which again, makes me a little sad that Paige was put in that situation, given the history, right? Like, I, I don't want to speculate on like how Paige feels about it now. I just, and it's like really hard because I don't want to criticize the moms, even though there's parts of me that are like, yeah, I really wish maybe you hadn't put your kids in this scenario. But again, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to be neutral here, but let me know your thoughts in the comments on this. I would love to know your thoughts in the comments about the moms having their kids in this situation. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to keep it, I'm trying to keep it neutral as best I can. Now, I don't know if Abby thought she would keep getting away with being a, in my opinion, a monster uh, to both a mom and her daughter forever, but everything came to a breaking point in season four when the team headed to New York City for a competition. Now, to set the scene, Paige and Chloe were best friends and were really excited to get a duet together because of how rare that opportunity was. If Maddie was Abby's like unequivocal favorite, Chloe was a close second for Abby. So those two were usually paired off and everything would have been okay, especially considering the duet went over 
over amazingly if it weren't for Abby adding another duet pair of Maddie and Kalani, ensuring that Paige and Chloe had no chance of winning, which led to this. Dance mom Abby Lee Miller versus Kelly Highland. Now this is ugly, mm -hmm. ugly, ugly. <laughs> Kelly slapped Abby on the show. Abby filed a criminal complaint and Kelly countered with a $5 million lawsuit. Now this is considered the absolute most heated argument in Dance Mom's history for a reason because it was less an argument and more a full ass rumble. Uh, we've got screaming and shouting, we've got a lunging, we've got actual physical slapping, we've got hair pulling. I mean, bitch, this was a fight, a fight, 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 fight. Kelly claims that the breaking points for her was Abby yelling at her kids and that Abby was the provocateur here, stating that Abby struck first with, and I, this is quite a description, a quote, Cujo-like attack, which if you didn't know is a reference to a killer dog from a Stephen King book. Now, Abby allegedly was, quote, gnashing her teeth loudly, attempting to bite Kelly, if you see the footage. And in later legal documents surrounding this fight, uh, Kelly, or via her attorney, proceeded to shade and body shame Abby for being, quote, a very large woman who weighs around 300 pounds or so as being part of the reason the fight escalated. But also the thing is like, Adults, again, like I said, adults greenlit this. The kids were all present for this, for this fight, right? The kids, this is a, it was a real fight. This wasn't like some scripted thing and the kids were all prepped for it. This was real. They witnessed this, they witnessed a lot of things. And I just don't think that they can be expected to discern reality entertainment from real life, especially when this real life thing, this fight happens. This was a real attack and producers kept the cameras rolling and this is literally up on their channel, uncensored, monetized, and unapologized. Thank you guys very much. We had 29% higher ratings uh, last the, the first episode back without any promos, without any publicity. So it was, it was great. And we have a great show planned for you tonight. Like I could literally once again do an entire segment about the potential psychological ramifications of this being filmed in front of kids, uh, with the kids' mothers engaging in this violent behavior for the world to see and everyone to weigh in. But I, I've literally done segments like that like a hundred other times in other docs. I even did a segment in the JoJo Siwa doc, if you want to see, where I, I took some actual testimonials of uh, former child stars and them talking about their experiences and the psychological effects that fame and being in these positions had on them. Some quotes from, uh, I think it was like Demi Lovato and Christina Aguilera, if you guys want to check that out. But again, I've done those types of segments a, a zillion times. And honestly, I don't think these networks are ever going to care or change their ways, which is, it's sad. And, and again, as long as people are tuning in and watching, why would they change? <sighs> Certainly not for the morals. Now, even though Kelly claims Abby was the aggressor, Abby was the one who called the cops and got Kelly arrested for assault. I was right in, in calling the police and, you know, doing what I needed to do, what I thought was necessary. Now, to be clear, those charges were later dropped and then followed up by Kelly Highland suing Abby and the Dance Moms producers for $5 million for assault, defamation, and breach of contract, revealing that she had not been getting paid regularly since the fight. The trial of Dance Mom Kelly Highland finally began in New York today. E.T. saw her and her adversary, Abby Lee Miller, heading into court. I think the judge will handle it, let's hope. And I think that the videotape speaks for itself. I'm hoping for a, a fair trial, and uh, I'm hoping for an acquittal. Uh, the case is what it is. There's videotape of it. It's quite clear what happens, that the alleged victim is the aggressor. My client is defending herself. Now, three things happened from here. First, Abby announced that Kelly, Brooke, and Paige were no longer going to be a part of the show. Second, Christy and her daughter, Chloe, also unexpectedly left the show, with Chloe later revealing that she was kicked out of the studio by the show's producers for not signing a contract that would allow production to control her weight and appearance, which if you didn't sign a contract for that, I have to say bravo, because, I don't know the particulars, so I, this is only speculation, but if they're trying to control your weight and appearance, it's kind of some bullshit. 
you don't deserve that. I might take this out of the video because I might get sued for saying it. I don't think so, but we'll see. The beginning of season four, but I got kicked out of the studio because to be a part of our studio, you had to sign a contract. A few of the main reasons I, well, my mom wouldn't sign was because it said stuff like you couldn't gain or lose five to 10 pounds, something like that. You couldn't do anything to your hair. You couldn't do anything to like piercings, no tattoos, which of course flipping 12 years old, I'm not doing any of that. I don't know if I would say I got kicked out more than I chose to leave because I knew what would happen if I didn't sign the contract, but I wasn't willing to agree to all of those terms. I'm just gonna leave it there. But the third thing that happened was a bit of a mask slip courtesy of another Highland lawsuit against Abby Lee Miller, though this one came straight from 13-year-old Paige Highland, who alleged that she suffered emotional and physical abuse at the hands of Abby Lee Miller. Now I wanna take a quick little pause because as an adult, pursuing a, a, anything legal, a lawsuit or, or anything of that matter, as an adult, that is incredibly stressful. Incredibly stressful. This is a 13 year old doing this. So this was a 13 year old who witnessed and experienced all of these things, the fight, the, the, the way Abby Lee Miller spoke to them on set, off set, all of those things. And now this still child is involved in a lawsuit, which she wouldn't be able to do without some type of adult assisting. And it's just, I, I, I have so many questions. Whose idea was this? And I'm not saying that Paige didn't, didn't have the right to, and I'm not saying that it, it was wrong. I'm just saying like, who was in charge of this and how was Paige doing throughout process of a lawsuit because I, I can't even imagine like and how how could she you're just the brain is just not ready for things like that and I just I really hope that this wasn't even more detrimental to Paige's health it's just like it, it's really upsetting and heartbreaking when you think about like all these little particular nuances of these stories that like maybe don't get like as much sensational coverage it's just it's it sucks now the language in regards to the lawsuit is is quite disturbing so I'm going to censor it all as best I can. You know, nothing visual will be shown or like any examples like that. We're gonna adhere to the platform's policies. But according to Paige Highland, Abby Lee Miller would purposefully allegedly you know, punch students until they started bleeding and this was said to have happened often. She would insult and harm Paige just about every day, uh, doing what was described as cruel name calling or insults about Paige's physical appearance, and for good measure would allegedly make her own allegations of abuse against Paige's family. So this is just very messy. All of this and Paige, a, again, a 13 year old girl, would work 60 hour weeks and 12 hour days. I don't know a lot of adults who work 60 hour weeks, let alone a 13 year old. Now, as for the emotional abuse, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a lot of it is right there on tape, in my opinion. But Paige alleges that this wasn't about motivating the girls. This was all to heighten the show's stakes. It was all for the drama, adding more reality into reality TV. And honestly, I still just think like throw it in, just throw it in the trash, like honestly throw it in the trash. But again, that's just my opinion. Like, you know, these girls, when they, when they grow up, it's, it's really about how do they feel about this? Now, unfortunately for Paige Highland, the suit was dismissed in July of 2015, making it really seem like Abby Lee Miller was a bit of a karma Houdini. You know, like all terrible actions, no retribution whatsoever. And I'm sure that Abby had a huge smile on her face about that for like, you know, three months. Explosive star of Dance Moms, Abby Lee Miller, her life is busting at the seams with drama right now, facing tax fraud charges, so no wonder Abby is on the edge in these first scenes from the new season. It's October 13th, 2015. The news is breaking that Lamar Odom was sent to a hospital after being found passed out in a brothel. The first Democratic debates in the US happened where we saw Hillary Clinton go head to head with Bernie Sanders and this guy. So here we go, here's the chorus. Iowa, Iowa. But the most relevant thing that happened that day in our story here was Abby Lee Miller getting indicted on charges that she was concealing her income from Dance Moms back in 2012 and 2013. Because there's so many different rumors and fragments of statements sure. out there that people think it was about tax and this and that, and it wasn't. She ended up getting charged with bankruptcy fraud, concealment of bankruptcy assets, and false bankruptcy declarations because she hid a whopping $755,000. Now, it turns out old Abby had filed for bankruptcy way back in 2010, and 
managed to sidestep any accountability by not showing a contract for Dance Moms. Now, there's a chance she could have gotten away with it if Judge Thomas Agresti, the man overhearing her proceedings, didn't see her on the freaking TV. Ladies, I'm just saying, if you're trying to get away with committing financial crimes of Abby Lee Miller magnitude, maybe don't star in one of the most successful TV shows of the year. It's just a thought. Also, just don't do that, okay? It's a bad idea. So he canceled a hearing to discharge the case and immediately requested that she disclose her contracts, telling a newspaper at the time that, quote, the problem here is that it looks to the court that she was hiding the ball and until she got caught, we wouldn't have known about this. In June 2016, she pled guilty and entered a plea deal with the IRS that led in May 2017 to her being sentenced to 366 days in prison and two years of supervised release, though she would only serve eight months in Victorville. Now, on top of that, there was a $40,000 fine and she was ordered to pay a $120,000 judgment. This was then followed by her stating that she would be walking away from Dance Moms at the end of the seventh season. Four days, Abby Lee Miller checks into a federal prison. So how is she spending her last days of freedom? I just want to kind of enjoy some laughter and some fun. Who's going with you when you do check into prison? Uh, lifetime, I believe. All right. <laughs> the cameras will be rolling, right? Why well, was it important for you to kind of like crazy. let the cameras come with you? I, I, it wasn't. It wasn't important to me. It was important to them. Really? Yes. Do you regret that they're showing up? Do you wish you could fight it? Now, unfortunately, the reason Abby left prison was because she was diagnosed with Burkitt lymphoma, uh, a rare type of cancer that affected her spine to the point that it put her in a wheelchair. Now, despite everything that Abby did to deserve her prison time, this was one of the worst things that could have happened to her and nobody deserves that type of suffering. When Abby got out of prison, she also revealed that for the entirety of her time in prison, not one of the families on the show visited her or checked to see how she was doing, which I mean, listen, like I can 100% understand why they may have chosen not to visit her, right? Like, but Abby did not seem to empathize or understand or maybe see from their perspective. Instead, she told Entertainment Tonight, quote, shame on you, shame on you after what I did for you, for your children, helped make you a lot of money. You couldn't come to visit me for eight and a half months. You couldn't send a card, a letter, but see, that's the thing, Abby. So cancer aside, because we will not belittle that nor discuss your diagnosis. So apart from that, this might be what someone calls, what was it? Uh, oh yeah consequences for your actions, maybe? Like Abby seemingly burned every bridge that she built and she hurt a lot of children along the way in doing it, allegedly. Now, I won't pretend to know exactly how each of these kids felt, but considering that Dance Moms came back for just one season after Abby got out of prison and not one of the original girls or moms returned, I think it's safe to say that we could probably speculate with decent accuracy as to why none of these girls came back. And well, it actually gets a a lot worse as to why the girls didn't come back. Especially when we talk about the time that Abby posted one of those, you know, those black squares to Instagram on June 2nd, 2020, remember Blackout Tuesday? You know, like that was the time that some folks posted a black square to show solidarity in response to the murders of George Floyd, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and countless others. Yeah, well, Abby posted one too, and Adriana Smith, whose daughter Cameron was on season eight of Dance Moms, was not happy. So she posted her own Instagram response, quote, a statement from her that sticks in my mind to this day during my time on Dance Mom season eight is, I know you grew up in the hood with only a box of eight crayons, but I grew up in the country club with a box of 64, don't be stupid. <laughs> oh, it has taken my entire body and my entire soul and my spirit not to take Take this to Petty University because of the sensitive parts of this story, but holy sh it balls, can I please, I just, can I please just for one second, just let me do for just one, 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 one. Honey, baby, sweetie, pie, sugar, bunches of whole grain, gluten-free oats. Abby, 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 my dear Abby, come here, come here. Just a, just a little bit closer, just a little, some, I, just a little cake. I know you're not afraid to get closer to my face. Fuck. Off with that racist ass, dumb ass, janky ass, ignorant ass bullshit. 
it. Please and thank you. Okay, I'm done. Thank you for letting Professor Petty indulge for just a quick second. So this lovely allegation of racism was followed by another dance mom's mom named Camille Bridges, uh, outright accusing Abby of treating her daughter, whose name is also Cameron, but with a C, uh, differently because of her race, telling E! News that Abby, quote, tried to spin Cameron as being the poor one and there on scholarship because God forbid we think that black girls are just talented and deserving of their place in this world without somebody saying something racist. Now, in response to this, former Dance Moms producer Corey King wrote a private Facebook post that leaked to E! News that said, quote, some would say I should be quiet about this, but this, this broke me as I was working on the show and pregnant with my own black daughter. In hindsight, I too should have left. I should have stood with my sister, Adriana Janae Smith, and supported gorgeous baby Cam and left too. Seeing a seven-year-old little black girl be put in a box in a corner and treated so violently because of the color of her skin was heartbreaking. It reminded me of when I found out I was black at an age not much older than her. And when she's saying I found out I was black, it's not by looking in the mirror that she found out she's meaning racism reminded her that people think that she's less than. No, Abby responded by deleting her black square, which in my opinion is a little worse because you know what? Like if you're going to be performative while simultaneously trying to hide your casual and not so casual alleged racism, own that shit, right? Like honestly, like I see this a lot on social media, like someone will say some racist BS, like in a video or in a post, which they took the time to type out or, you know, with video, they took the time to film it and edited it and uploaded it with no problem. Then they get called out for it. And then they delete it as if it never happened and make excuses for their racism and hide behind, you know, usually the random white folks who defend their racism as no big deal, as if it's their place to excuse it in the first place while they also support the cover-up. So yeah, we see you, we see this stuff all the time and you think, oh, well, I just, you know, got rid of it. It doesn't change. Yeah, actually it does. It puts everything that comes out of your mouth in a whole new context. That's the way racism works. Just say it. Now, to be fair and mention, Abby made an apology post on June 4th stating, quote, I genuinely understand and deeply regret how my words have affected and hurt those around me in the past, particularly those in the black community. To Cameron, Adriana, and anyone else I've hurt, I am truly sorry. I realize that racism cannot just come from hate, but also from ignorance. No matter the case, it is harmful and it is my fault. While I cannot change the past to remove the harm I've done, I promise to educate myself, learn, grow, and do better. While I hope to one day earn your forgiveness, I recognize that words alone are not enough. I understand it takes time and genuine change. And <laughs> quote. Ah! <laughs> Listen, obviously I wasn't the direct recipient of Abby's racism, so I'm not gonna sit here and accept or reject her apology on their behalf because they're the only ones who can accept or reject this. Now, that being said, I will say, just because we're sitting here in a swoop dock as a certified member of the Blackity Black community, it is with my great and distinct pleasure that I wholeheartedly, emphatically do not accept this apology as a black person who has to see this you are not yeah! the father. Yeah! Like saying like, I learned that like racism doesn't just come from hate, it comes from ignorance. That wasn't ignorant. It wasn't ignorant. That was not ignorance. You knew, you knew, you knew, in my opinion. You're talking about you came from the hood. That's not ignorance. That's hate. Talking about your six box of crayons and you got 64 crayons in the country club. Do you really want us to think that that was an ignorance remark? And it also seems a little weird to only address Cameron with a K and Adriana and not Camille and Cameron with a C, but you know, you do you, Abby. I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that there's more you should say to other non-white kids from your show, like Nia, Asia, Kalani, Paris, uh, need I say more? And don't just take it from me. I a day later on June 5th, Lifetime seemed to agree, cutting ties all together with Abby Lee Miller and canceling her Abby's virtual dance off competition reality show that had been announced. And between then and now, both of Abby's dance studios shut down and it seemed like finally, Abby Lee Miller's alleged reign of terror was done.
Okay, quick heads up, there won't be anything graphic, but there will be reference to an eating disorder for a few seconds. Uh, since Dance Moms ended, many of the girls have gone on in their lives to varying degrees of success. Now, believe me when I say uh, that there are far too many former Dance Mom stars to check up on right now, but I wanted to focus on a few, in particular in the aftermath of the show ending, starting with uh, Chloe, Abby's apparent least favorite girl, who revealed a few years after the show ended that Dance Moms actually might have led to Chloe developing a few EDs. Now, according to Chloe, her ED began shortly after leaving the show, stating that she did not change her diet after leaving. Quote, when I was on the show, I was dancing pretty much every day except for Sundays, so I was burning so many calories and I was just uh, pretty fit and I was able to eat whatever I wanted because I was working out every day. So there were no limits to what I could eat because I knew I would burn it off later. But also when you're 11, you don't really think about burning off food and Quote. Now, this led to Chloe admitting that she developed body dysmorphia because the weight she gained felt unacceptable to her after her years on the dance circuit. As Chloe put it, it started out as bulimia and then later developed into anorexia. These disorders could have possibly even taken Chloe's life if she hadn't gone to therapy for much needed assistance. Now, thankfully she admits she's in a better place now and has also come to terms with her years on Dance Moms, revealing exactly why she left the show and I just want to applaud her for getting the help uh, that she uh, seems to have needed because that is not a an easy thing for someone to go through and she's so incredibly brave and we just want to give her her flowers uh, for for living through that and just a just a quick sidebar because I can't not say this I just want to remind any of you who might have or might be struggling with body issues or food related stresses I, I genuinely mean this like you are so damn worthy exactly as you are. Your body, uh, no matter the size, the shape, the color, the, the the scars, the dimples, the the illness, the injury, the way it might cling, the way it jiggles, the way it folds, like you are so f***ing incredible and so brilliantly strong and so unbelievably worthy of all of the beautiful things in this world and not to feel ashamed of your body. As, as someone who, you know, who's lived through some uh, let me tell you that I just I just want to be someone who says the things that I wish I had been told when I really needed to hear it. That's why I take these moments to say these types of things because I needed to hear them at some point. And if I have a platform, I feel like it's a responsible thing for me to say the things that I hope might help somebody. You are a champion for bringing your body this far in life, for, for still being here, and I want you to know that your body is valid exactly as it is in this moment. Bodies change, they all do. Mine's changing constantly all the time, but you will always be worthy, always. Okay, I'm done, sorry. I, sorry, it feels a little sappy or cringe to people, whatever, I don't care. I, I, I'm gonna keep saying it, so but back to the story. So most of the girls on Dance Mom seem to have gone uh, on uh, to be the best they could and to live relatively well adjusted lives, at least from, you know, looking on the outside. Of course, you never know what's going on with someone. But next to nobody from Dance Mom seems to have thrived after leaving the show quite like Abby's former favorite Maddie Ziegler. And by thrive, I mean like career wise, right? Now, after and even during Dance Moms, Maddie launched an acting career and popped up in everything from, you know, Sia's many music videos, West Side Story remake and Max's TV show, The Fallout. She got brand deals. She started a podcast. She has over 6 million or so like TikTok followers as of me recording this. She's surpassed Dance Moms and thrived as a result, but how much of this does she credit to Abby Lee Miller? Like most of the conversation surrounding Abby, that's, that's complicated. In an interview with Cosmopolitan, Maddie was asked point blank, uh, did you ever want to quit Dance Moms while you were on it? To which Maddie said, quote, it is hard when you're really loyal to your dance group. I was the most loyal girl there. I just wanted to dance and I loved competing until it became televised and the drama started. Don't get me wrong, there's drama regardless if there are cameras or not, but it was heightened. I started to feel like it's so peaceful outside of this world. I can't 
be in this. My family and I really tried to leave for the last three seasons, but when you're in a contract, it's really hard. Eventually, I finally got out. Now, Maddie goes on to describe how she and her family felt guilty over Abby feeling betrayed because on one hand, Abby Lee Miller trained her, but on the other hand, she said uh, she knew that she, quote, would be okay without her, and I was sick of being in a toxic environment. I was like, this is not for me. I can't do this. I haven't spoken to her since. Future of Dance Moms now that Maddie is not gonna be around. I know, but I'm so excited! Are you excited? Yes! Really? Well, no, you know, I create stars. It's what I do. It's now, to this day, she still, as far as we know, hasn't spoken with Abby. And I think that the silence there speaks volumes. I think there are a lot of situations in the world where people set very firm, hard boundaries on someone else. And I have learned that you can set boundaries and you don't have to communicate them with that person. If you set that boundary that you're just, you're done, you don't owe them an explanation. They just they just get to, to deal with it. I've done this even in the last like six months. I've had people uh, in, in personal encounters and even like work related things where someone crossed a line with me and violated my my boundaries and my, my even my family's boundaries. They violate my trust. I or I feel like I'm being manipulated or there's abuse that has happened and I have had to learn that it's okay to set very firm boundaries with those people. And for me, that has often meant I just stop communicating with them entirely and I don't explain why. And that's something that's like really difficult for me to do. It's like really difficult to cut someone off and cut someone out of my life. And especially to like not talk to them. I was always the type of person like, oh no, I need to, I need to talk to them. I need to tell them, you know, no. Uh, it's taken a lot of uh, my mental health support team being with me and, and, and helping me understand that I don't owe explanations and then I just never speak to them again. They just don't hear from me. You don't hear from me again. You don't. Anytime I don't speak to someone again, it's always with a very good reason. It's always, always with a very good reason. And that's that. And so I commend Maddie, if that's the situation with her, I want to applaud her for, for doing something like that. And then just remind all of you guys that it's okay to set firm boundaries and know you don't have to communicate them if you don't want to. Anyways, I don't know why I went on that tangent, but here we go. Over the years since that interview with Maddie, uh, Abby sure has talked quite a bit about it. Going back to that quote I was said a million times today, she talks about how I trained her. I helped her. I'm glad. I'm glad that there was finally a small, tiny smidgen of recognition because I did train her and I did help her. A lot of people at the studio did. And I know that what I did for Maddie, with Maddie, helped her succeed. I remember hugging that kid close to me. I thought that I had helped her. Now that last line, she trained me, she helped me, but I knew I'd be okay without her. Isn't that what teachers do? Don't they train you so that you will be okay without them? That's what I did. I did the tutoring, I did the parenting. Go off and succeed. Use the tools that I instilled in you. And just this year on the well-known Sophia Franklin podcast that we started this doc with, Abby told Sophia, Dance Moms, Maddie Ziegler was your favorite. She's recently come out and talked about how the environment was toxic or abusive or whatever she said. And how do you feel about that? I was obviously hurt, mm -hmm. but I also felt strange. Hmm. It was an odd feeling of how a child doesn't remember. Mm. I hugged that kid so close and so tight to my body while her mother and dad were screaming obscenities at each other. So if it was so toxic, why when we had a break was she not in the class at the studio? Why was she not near me? Why was she not with me? Yeah. Well, I mean, we were making money, so maybe the people would say, well, she just only went to get the money. Mm -hmm. I don't know, she was a child. It was fun, we had a great time. And I, I, was, I was hurt and I was confused and I thought, Did she, was she brainwashed? Did she not remember? Did she go to like some place where they like erase your memory? Like how do you not remember all of that? 
which leads us to maybe the only Dance Moms alum who has gone on record defending Abby Lee Miller. Miss Jojo Siwa, who we covered at length in a doc, uh, which you can watch after this one. Now to Jojo, Dance Moms made Jojo Siwa. Uh, she started singing, acting, vlogging, and along the way picked up millions of followers and fans. She's even become a brand unto herself with Jojo dolls, Jojo backpacks, Jojo board games, Jojo ice cream, uh, she's written books. She was on The Masked Singer. She made Time's Most Influential People list. She even had her own TV show. She's also made a bit of a reputation as a sort of one person PR front for canceled celebrities with post cancellation appearances uh, or defenses of people like James Charles. Shall we? We shall. Swapskis. Mm. Colleen Ballinger. The internet can take a lie and run so far with it, so far. Shane Dawson. <laughs> and yes, Abby Lee Miller. Jojo, would y'all, are you, are you in touch with her still? Yeah, I would say, how's your Thursday going? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I feel like when I left the show, there was like a year that we didn't really talk, but then after that, you're fine. Yeah, we're chilling. Telling Us Magazine in May of 2020, quote, I actually talked to Abby the most out of anybody from the show. She's great. I think Abby got hurt by a lot of people and it's really, really, really sad that a lot of the people don't talk to her anymore. The same thing with a lot of the producers from Dance Moms. It's just sad because Abby really is a good person. Even though you see her yelling and screaming at children on TV, like Abby made seven stars. I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for her. Maddie and Mackenzie Ziegler wouldn't be where they are today without Abby, which is very bold, very bold for Jojo to be speaking on behalf of Maddie and Mackenzie, in my opinion, especially when we heard what Maddie had to say. But it's just, it's wild to see Jojo continually have this theme of defending people who have done things that are <laughs> seem to be allegedly quite harmful, even down to Abby Lee Miller's alleged racism, right? And I, and I wonder like, is this actually how Jojo feels or does she just feel like she has to speak this way about people who have helped her in her career? I don't know, I can only speculate there. Very recently, uh, Jojo was defending Abby on her own podcast. You know what a tough dance teacher is like. We all have them. And truthfully, throughout my life, I've had dance teachers that were way tougher on me than Abby was. And so that's why I was kind of almost trained to be able to handle it. Now, the only thing I really have to say about all of this is Jojo. I'm really hoping that one day you can unpack why exactly you feel the need to go to bat for people like that. Yes, you are very successful and it seems like you think it's because of these people and I understand to certain degrees wanting to stay loyal to the people you think helped make your career. But you know, I think you're successful because you know, whether people like you and your music and stuff or not. Like, I think you're successful because you've been working your ass off since you were a child. And I just don't think you owe that kind of attitude to people who may have mistreated or used you. But again, I don't want to put words in Jojo's mouth because she has said that she doesn't think she was abused in these situations. So I'm not going to claim that she was if she says she wasn't, you know, it's, that, that's, that's what that is. I'm just Truly hoping that one day Jojo realizes that it is okay to call out mistreatment. Like when you say, yeah, she was screaming and yelling at kids, but seven of them became stars. It's like, what if we just stopped at the screaming and yelling part? Like, what if we just took a look at that? <laughs> you know, that's just my thoughts. What message would you all like to send Abby Lee? If anything at all. <laughs> I mean, I, hey. I still talk to her. <laughs> yeah. You still yeah. talk to her? I think that everybody's experience with her is very different. I know for me, I would not be sitting in this chair. I would not have the career I have if it wasn't for Abby. Do I agree with everything she's done to me, my family, my friends? Absolutely not. I think that everybody deserves an apology, but I, you know, I'm able to move on and move past mm -hmm. it and. On May 1st, 2024, Lifetime released a two hour special under the title Dance Moms The Reunion, which got the whole gang back together, older, wiser, and more able to process everything they went through together. Chloe returned, Jojo and Jessalyn, Paige, Brooke and Kelly Highland, Kendall and Jill, and Kalani and her mom Kira. Most notably missing from the reunion, Maddie. 
Mackenzie, Nia, and also Abby Lee Miller, who many of the girls said would have been a distracting presence if she were involved, to the point that most of them actually refused to do the reunion if she were even around. As Kalani told TV Insider, quote, I think that we wouldn't have been as open and vulnerable and honest if we had that kind of energy in the reunion. I think it was best having it just be us girls and being able to really open up to each other. I think if she was there, none of us would have been able to. Now, this was something Paige agreed with, who stated, quote, the whole point was for it to be a safe space for us to open up and reflect. And I feel like it would have been the same thing where we would have been scared to say anything. And I just, I just gotta say like my brain, it's hard for me to even, I'm glad if they feel like the, this was a safe space for them. It's just hard for me to even like wrap my head around it actually fully being a safe space because this was like hosted and platformed by Lifetime, which was the network that allowed all of this to happen in the show and made a whole series out of it and made like big bucks off of it. You know what I mean? So like, was it fully a safe space? I don't know. Now to JoJo's credit, she actually revealed on her podcast on May 2nd that producers actually did try to pressure her into getting Abby to appear on the show in secret, but she turned them down. And then the last thing that was shady is that the producers kept wanting me to call Abby. And I was like, absolutely not. I was like, that's that's where I put my foot down because I was like, all right, look, I'm not only putting myself in an awkward position of calling and in this environment that no one invited her to, but also I'm putting Abby in a weird situation where she's talking to people who she doesn't necessarily know how to talk to them. And then... Paige, Brooke, and Chloe, I was like, I'm not gonna do that to them either because this was somebody who was a massive figure in their life that walked out of their life. There is real trauma there. Now, if I had just one word for the vibe of the Dance Moms reunion, it would probably be divided. As far as I can find, there hasn't been a public reason given for Maddie and Mackenzie not to attend, but based on what she's already said publicly, can you blame her? And yet throughout the special, that's exactly what Jojo, Siwa, and a few other girls do. Blame them for not participating them, calling them, quote, ungrateful, with Jojo specifically calling out Maddie and Mackenzie for not facing their trauma head on. Can you fucking imagine the actual balls of Jojo saying that about someone like, blaming Maddie after what we've read that she said, saying, blaming her for not facing her trauma head on as if you have to face your trauma head on and as if you have to face it on a massive network televised show. But what do I know, right? Now for Dance Moms fans, there were a few moments of the old razzle dazzle as the moms talked on each other, uh, whether they were at the reunion or not, with Christy FaceTiming in to accuse Maddie and Mackenzie's mom, Melissa, of, uh, quote, throwing a fire blanket on any bomb that was gonna go off today, and she took it, uh, in reference to orchestrating an on-camera birthday party that Dance Moms alumni were invited to the day before the special. Uh, maybe the most interesting part of the special was the presence of the Highland family, who had essentially dropped out of the reality TV and dance uh, circus all together following Kelly's fight with Abby. As Brooke stated on the special, quote, I have not spoken or seen her in 10 years since the last day we were on the show. Now, Brooke reveals after this that she actually quit dancing following the scuffle and doesn't regret it. Quote, I was burnt out before the show even started. <laughs> I wanted to be a normal teenager. I wanted to go to school, dances and football games. So for that part of it, it was kind of a relief. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so intense. When I left, I was like, how do I function? <laughs> <laughs> How do I we were so life? busy all the time. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do anything. Yeah. I was like yeah. just going to regular football games. I actually ended up doing volleyball, but I was so focused on just being a regular a kid. Yeah. Yeah. The stuff that we missed we out just, on like, because went we back were to school. so focused on yeah. dance. Now, the special provides a bit of an interesting look into the headspace of the stars and the complicated legacy dance moms leaves behind it, but it doesn't tell the full story. Uh, for instance, in a follow-up interview uh, conducted by Lauren Garafano for BuzzFeed, Chloe and Christy admit they they did uh, the special simply because they knew if they weren't, they wouldn't be able to control their own stories, which I think is quite fair. As Chloe puts it, quote, it's better to just go on and be able to feel assured about everything. I wanted to be able to just go on and speak my mind and address some of the issues that we never got to talk about before. It really truly felt like closing the book on Dance Moms, which was good for me. I needed that closure to move on and kind of leave Chloe from 
dance moms in the past and go forward as my own individual self, which we wish the best for her and all of them. We skate with our mom. <laughs> my was, mom and I, when was, we lived in LA, we lived in a one bedroom yeah. apartment when we were filming Dance Moms. We slept in the same bed for four years. And just the car rides together. They didn't get to see their husbands. We didn't get to see our dads, our siblings. siblings. All we did was spend had, time And we with only our had each other. Wow. When it comes to non-participants who have said why they didn't attend, we have Nia who posted a TikTok with her side of the story. Okay, I hate to break it to you guys, but um, the reason is quite simple. I just, I just really didn't want to do it. Yeah, it's pretty plain and simple. I just didn't want to do it. Um, some people think it was because I had sorority stuff. Nope, I didn't. Um, some people think it's because I'm in school. I am in school, but it wouldn't have been an issue. I just, I just don't want to do it. And that's a good enough answer. And that's a good enough reason. And something I wanted to say is I think almost in any interview I've done, when someone has asked me about the show, I always say that I'm grateful for it. It's where I came from. It's how I got my stars. The reason why I have such an amazing life now, truly. Like I, I love my life. I have a fabulous life, and I'm truly enjoying it. I love the girls, and I'm really happy for them. And I'm really happy that they get to share how they felt or their experiences. Um, but that's just something that I decided I didn't want to do, and that's okay. Also, I never said that I wouldn't do a reunion show in the future or talk about my experiences in the future. But right now at this moment, it just was not the right time for me to do that. And yeah, that's that's the that's the reason. <laughs> um, sorry to disappoint anyone who wanted me there. But, um, but yeah, that's that's it. Love you guys. Now, Jojo actually opened up about her time on Dance Moms in another episode of her podcast on May 5th, where she revealed that she believed the show was detrimental, but a blessing. Something that I think really was detrimental to my career and was massive for me, which was Dance Moms. Um, we had the Dance Moms reunion just happen, and the Dance Moms reunion, um, you know, it was a mixed bag of bones for me, for sure. Dance Moms as a whole is not a mixed bag of bones for me. It is the biggest blessing of my entire life. Uh, which leads us back to Abby Lee Miller, who shared regrets on her previous teaching style in an interview with ABC. In the most Abby Lee Miller way imaginable. Do you think that you would take back some of the harshness or any of it when you look back? Absolutely, on? yes, I would. Why? Because no matter how harsh I was on the kid, they weren't gonna get it. They just didn't have the talent. They didn't have it. But you're saying you regret it not because you hurt the kids' feelings, but because it was pointless. Well, no, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. I want to get them to be better and to be the best that they can be. Un believable. Now, she was a bit more explicit on Bethany Frankel's Just Be podcast on May 9th uh, when she revealed her point of view on why she wasn't on the special, which she claims is because of her own fractured point of view on Lifetime. Have okay. you followed their careers? Are you following JoJo now? How like JoJo's got yes. this new, you know, everyone's talking yes. about her and she's a little I more- talked to her, I talked to her on the phone yesterday. Yes. Oh, you did? And you have, so you have a good relationship? Absolutely. And do you love Absolutely. what she's doing? I mean, she's is she, she's entitled to like have changed her style. Like, she... I'm not the boss of her anymore. I'm not in charge of the choreography. I'm not in charge of her costuming anymore. Why didn't she push for you to be on that show together if you guys have a good relationship now? She knows. She'll tell you she wouldn't be where she is today. Do you take any accountability for all of this mess that I just read on paper? Do you take any responsibility? Like I, besides like blaming the lawyers and blaming the networks and blaming the kids and blaming the moms, like do you personally take any responsibility for I any blame, of them? I don't blame any of the kids. I, you asked me why they didn't want me in the reunion. Paige sued me for $5 million. Obviously got thrown out of court immediately. How does she look at me? Again, knowing. Okay, I didn't even yeah. know that. Yeah, okay, okay, got it, okay. Yeah. Okay, please excuse the tone shift, but I think we need a bit of a kitty palette cleanser and then I will conclude with my final thoughts. So look at these sweet little angel baby kitties, the building department, my little baby honeys. I love them all so, 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 so much. Once again, you can grab your pieces from the brand new Petty University Valid collection and the Valid rib cage by tapping the link below and in the pinned comment. Again, I designed these pieces for anyone who was looking for clothing with positive reminders that you are incredible, beautiful, and valid. Uh, you are, no matter what you look like, no matter what you've lived through or what you want to do in life. And y'all just, they make me feel good. So many of you have uh, just messaged me with how, how just how these 
clothes. It's something so simple, just lift you up. And I've even received messages from some of you, people like who don't even know you, like reading the, the message on the back of your sweatshirt and, and saying that it made them feel good too. And that's all I hope for with these clothes is that we can make people feel, feel good. Also, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Both are linked below. That's where I post most often and have polls and check in on life and uh, post opportunities to be featured in upcoming Swoop Docs. Uh, and please do keep tagging me in your outfit photos. Uh, I love reposting you on my Instagram stories when I can. Also, I have officially launched a brand new second channel called Swoop2, T-O-O. -O. That's where we dip into the dark waters of the sus pool where everything and everyone is sus, maybe. Even us, yes, maybe. <laughs> we dip into all kinds of dark, bizarre, and mind-bending stories. There's some true crime, just unhinged stories. The videos are much shorter, so yeah, it's a good time over there uh, if you wanna join us. A couple of shout outs that I scooped up real quick from my Jojo Siwa duck. It's also linked below. I highly recommend giving it a watch after this one. Uh, first shout out goes to Samantha who says, okay, I honestly didn't know much about her. Uh, to me, the rebrand seems more of a shock thing to get people talking about her. I am also worried about her vocal cord thing because I am looking at what Adele went through. I'm hoping she doesn't push herself too much because of it. And you know, again, say what you want about Jojo Siwa, I, I, for sure, there's a lot of just stuff that is just, it was marketing to get people talking about it and congratulations, because they won, right? Everyone was talking about it. But yeah, the vocal cord thing, that's a, that's a real deal. Hope someone has taken care of that for her. Second shout out goes to Zab Nails, who says, please do a full deep dive into Dance Moms and Abby, a bunch of words that I probably shouldn't say Miller. The abuse, allegedly, in my opinion, was so, so, so horrific to watch it. It literally gave me flashbacks. And number one, I hope the flashbacks aren't something you personally experienced. If you did, I am so sorry. I hope you're doing well. And and then secondly, ask and you shall receive. So I hope, I hope this was a uh, up to your up to your standards. Now, as per usual, if you wanna be my next shout out, make sure you're following me on Twitter and retweet this video right here. Be sure to download the free game Murder in the Alps and click the link in my description box or use the QR code here to download the game straight to your phone right now. I absolutely love this game and I think you will too. So download and start playing today. You deserve it, honey. The story of Dance Moms, given everything we've just discussed, is a much more complicated and nuanced story than I think people like to give it credit for. And it's a level of nuance that even the stars themselves are still kind of wrapping their heads around, referring to their relationship with the show as a trauma bond, which I think is probably accurate, at least for many of them. Uh, the most important factor here, however, is that in every which way, the girls of Dance Moms have all become women that are hopefully thriving, both in spite of and because of Dance Moms. Maddie Ziegler and Jojo Siwa, regardless of how people feel, uh, are bona fide celebrities. Uh, Kenzie has over 15 million followers on Instagram, having found success as a singer. Chloe is a published author looking to get back into dance. Uh, Nia is in college, also finding success as a singer like Kenzie. Uh, Brooks living a jet set life, traveling the world while also running her bite-sized foodie and Highlands sisters accounts on Instagram with Paige, uh, who recently graduated from college. Congratulations. Uh, Kalani is in her self-described health and wellness era. We love to see that. Having launched a beauty brand called Kane, so check all of all of their works out if you guys want. Cameron with a C works with freaking Kendrick Lamar. And Jojo, well, Jojo be Jojoing. <laughs> And even though all of this is public knowledge about Abby Lee Miller, some of which is incredibly well known, it doesn't really appear that Abby or even Dance Moms will stay in the past considering the sheer amount of press Abby continues to get, as well as random reality TV stunt casting hijinks where Abby gets to still be on TV, like her recent appearance on House of Villains. No matter how Abby or Jojo characterizes it, I think it's important to maintain that we do not need to put children through psychological and physical hell to help them refine any craft of their own. Again, I am a musician and dancer and performer myself, and although the craft is very, very tough and the industry is brutal, 
I know from experience, uh, it can be done without being a complete monster. Now it's rare, that wasn't even my path. I experienced quite a number of monsters, but it can be done. Abby Lee Miller for years took things to an unusually cruel level and doesn't really seem to care if anybody thinks that because she disagrees. But I guess time will tell if the Abby Lee Millers of the world will truly learn or if history is destined to repeat itself. All we can do is hope parents weigh more heavily the options before putting their kids on shows like these and that networks maybe actually try to give a shit once in a while, allegedly. <laughs> but until then, you know, stay ready, stay petty, class dismissed. Spoop!